Here's what I have learned personally. God has to bruise you before he can use you. Let me say those words again. God has to bruise you before he can use you. In fact, I, I like the way A.W. Tozer kind of encapsulates that. He says, it's doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. I believe today in these next few moments that God is going to speak something that is going to revolutionize our lives. I want us to pray. Father, would you come speak today? May the Holy Spirit begin to take these words on this one-year anniversary that, that Times Square Church began to go online and begin to touch people even through digital and technology. When the doors shut because of this pandemic, God, I thank you that, Lord, though it seemed to be difficult, yet the fruit has been amazing to see what you have done around this city and around the world. And God, there are people that are watching today. There are people that are online with us today that understand what it is to be bruised and to be wounded deeply. And now may the Holy Spirit show us that there is purpose in all of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Thomas Chisholm was really not only sickly, but he was in man's eyes, he was a failure. In fact, he tried to sell insurance, failed. He tried to farm, um, farming, couldn't make it. In fact, he said, I'm going to do a Christian magazine, edited it, that failed. And then he even said, I'm going into the ministry as a Methodist pastor. That only lasted a year. He sat down despite all of these failures, feeling like this, this, these years of pain was, was literally taking a toll of him on him. And then he didn't know what was, what was next for him other than seeing failure. But he did see God's faithfulness in providing for him and his family. And out of the clear blue, Thomas Chisholm wrote these words because it seemed as God was bruising him, it seemed that something he would write, God would use him to minister to countless millions of people. I know I was one of those that out of Tom Thomas Chisholm's pain, I was one of those that would minister to. Thomas penned these words that have affected so many lives. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not. Thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. And then he trumpets these words. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness. Lord, unto me. Those are powerful words that were birthed from many seasons of pain. It's been a year since the doors of our church and churches around the world have been closed and, and haven't been open. And there has not been one person in these last 12 months that doesn't have at least one story of deep pain whether that be from COVID, job loss, life upheaval, maybe even the loss of a loved one. However you fill in the blank, every single person listening has gone through a measure of pain. But that pain, if you are a lover of Jesus, is never wasted. In fact, let me say it like this. Your pain is not in vain. Your pain is not in vain. That word vain it's such a strong word. It means producing no result. It's useless. It has no real value. And I want to say this to you today. No Christian's journey is void of pain chapters and no pain chapter for the Christian is without purpose. Boy, those are important words for us to know. I don't want you or myself to miss our hymn moment of composing a great is thy faithfulness out of our pain that literally can bring blessing to whether it's one or one million people. Thomas Chisholm's pain was not in vain, and Thomas Chisholm's was for other people as what he went through. And today's challenge that I want to I want to bring to you today is not to stop short and miss the full blessing of God in those pain chapters. It's the next step when I'm through that chapter. God has to bruise you to use you. You read about those chapters, those pain chapters in the life of Abraham to Moses, from David to Paul, and ultimately 
to the most amazing pain chap that has transformed all of our lives, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And every time there is a pain chapter in a child of God's life, the next chapter is on that is on what it can produce in that person's life and even touch others. But that ultimate bruising, when you think about it, think of these great words from Isaiah that talks about the pain chapter, that prophesies of the pain chapter that was going to come to Jesus when he came to this planet. He says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. I want you just to think of those words for just a moment. Think how many times we, you, all of us are mentioned in Jesus's pain chapter. Think of this. It says, surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. We, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed five hours and one we and what pain produced in your life and in Jesus's life wasn't just simply for him it was for us and the same thing happens to all of us he was bruised and I think the same thing happens to us now this could be hard for some people to hear today but stay with me. There is hope in all of this because the goal of going through difficulty is not accomplished when you are done with the difficult circumstance. But that's what we have to hear today. We're not finished when the pain is finished. That God wants to bless you is only half right. God blesses you to be a blessing. That's the whole truth. See, that's the danger of any church, pulpit, or preacher that preaches blessing on you without the other side of you being a blessing to others. Because if you miss that, it becomes half of a gospel, half of a truth. See, God does want to bless you, but if you stop there, then it becomes a selfish message, not a complete one. God blesses us, comforts us, ministers to us in our pain moments so we can become a blessing to others. And no better way that works than to seeing how blessing can come out of those difficult pain chapters that when it turns into blessing other people. When comfort comes to us, that's a blessing. But when all of a sudden that comfort begins to minister to others, that's the gospel. That's the truth. Second Corinthians chapter one is that chapter and book that deals with this whole topic. See, second Corinthians chapter one moves us on a journey from pain to comfort. And here it comes. Then from, com and then from comfort to to comforting people. Let me say those words again. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 moves us on a journey from pain to comfort, and then after we receive the comfort, it moves into comforting other people. That's Paul's story. That's Paul's message. Listen to these words. This is chapter, this is verse 3 of chapter of 2 Corinthians 1. Paul says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our afflictions, here it comes, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. And verse six says, but if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. He says, there's the purpose in this. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort. Do you understand what he's saying? He said, affliction, I'm going to use that to minister to you. Comfort, I'm going to use that to minister to you, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. And then it says in verse 7, our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our suffering, so also you're going to be sharers of our comfort. I, I, I want to give you just a little bit of a side note here for just a moment. Do you, I, because I don't know if you got this. Do you understand that the word comfort appears 30 times in the New Testament? And what's amazing is one third of them are right here in these five verses. One third of the 30 of them. 10 of the 30 are right there. Paul uses the word comfort 10 times 
in five verses. I think he was saying something to us very powerful. Go, go back and read it and then just circle in your Bible every time you see the word comfort from the God of all comfort. And then when he ends in verse seven, that you are sharers in our comfort, that is, that is 10 times in those five verses. That's why this passage can revolutionize all of our lives. Because what he was saying was this, pain is inevitable, comfort is promised for the believer, but being a comforter, that's optional. That's if you're gonna take the blessing that has come to you and you're gonna begin to use it as a ministry moment. See, I know my chapters of pain in my own life have produced something deep in me, but it wasn't just for me. See, pain is not just for depth. Pain is for distance to carry you and also my pain is for others. And so God, that's what Paul was trying to tell us. Because here's the key thing I want you to hear. God doesn't comfort us to make us comfortable. God comforts us to make us comforters for other people. See, when you go through a season of pain, you have three choices. You can let it define you, you can let it destroy you, or you can let it deliver other people. That's what makes this amazing. See, that those pain chapters, those pain moments is what God builds depth and distance and even deliverance for other people. Let me say that again. When we go through that chapter, it's God putting depth in us, giving us distance to go into the next seasons of our life, but it's also for deliverance of other people. I, I, I'm not a golfer, but but I was always wondering, why don't they use kind of ping pong balls for golf? Why, did, why does it have to have all these little indentations on it? Like you look at a golf ball, everything is dented in around the whole thing. And here's what I found. When they first manufactured golf balls, they made the first ones all, the, the whole cover smooth. It looked like a ping pong ball. And then it was discovered that after a ball had been roughed up, that more distance can come out of it. So they started manufacturing golf balls with dimples and dents in them. I have to tell you, I think that happens in the Christian life. I think those dents, when we go through those painful moments, is God going, this is to take you further than you've ever been before. That instead of looking at a dent and getting bitter, you're going, God, you're putting depth, you're putting distance, and there is a message of deliverance in the dent. And that's what our passage is. That's what 2 Corinthians 1 is about. It's about going further with our pain into ministry. And in a sense, it's rescuing others. I'm not sure in all my years of ministry that I'm hearing counseling, counseling agencies telling people that when you're experiencing pain and going through that pain chapter, you're going through that so you can help others. I think we're trying to find ways to pull people out but we're not giving them the bigger picture saying what you're going through, that dent in you, deepen distance and deliverance for you. You are experiencing this. Just to hear a counselor say would be amazing. You're experiencing this because you are going to minister others and help them through their pain situation. That's Paul. That's 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 7. Pain is depth, pain is distance, and pain is for deliverance. I've heard the title many times, from preachers who say, don't waste your pain. But really the better, better challenge is this, don't waste your comfort. It's, it's, it's saying that when God comforts you, don't stop there. That's only half, half the battle. See, what happens to you is for ministry to flow through you. What happens to you is for ministry to flow through you. That's why difficulties are not random and they're not disconnected. The difficulties that we have faced, even in this last year, whether it's as a church, as a family or as an individual, is a classroom for every one of us. One pastor said it like this, your greatest ministry will most likely come out of your greatest hurt. Wow, your greatest ministry will most likely come out of your greatest hurt. That's why my comfort is never the end of my struggle. My comfort is not the end. That's not what I'm trying to get to. It's one big step short. My comfort is for others. That's the finale of pain. That's why 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4, the Apostle Paul says it like this, Blessed be the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our affliction. Why? So that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. That's the huge step. That's the depth going through it. That's the distance that we are going to people. And here come the deliverance. That those who are in any affliction... This is important words with the comfort with which we ourselves 
are comforted by God. Comforted, he said, in all our affliction. Boy, all means all. It means, it means no matter what you're faced with right now, no matter what you're going through, no matter what the loss or the loneliness, no matter what the depression or, or the feeling of, of, of desertion is going on inside of you, whether you face a divorce or a death, he says he, you will be comforted in all your affliction. Why? So that you will be able to comfort those in any affliction. He says what you go through is for the comfort of anybody who's going through something. All and any are such powerful words. But here's the part I want to just focus on. How does God comfort us? Because some of you are watching today need to experience that comforting and to realize he's going to comfort so you become a comforter. Let me speak to that because the comfort that comes to you so the comforting can be released through you. And I've seen, not only in my own life, but most importantly right here in the scriptures, there's four ways that comfort comes. In that verse, when he says, when he says to us that the God of all comfort who comforts us in our affliction, that's a huge word. How does that comfort come? Four ways I've seen it. I've seen it come through people, the paraclete, which I'll define in a second, the prophetic, and I've also seen it through prayer. Let me walk you through those because these are so important. First, God brings comfort through people when we're going through it. I've realized this in my life. When Satan wants to mess with you, he sends the wrong people. When God wants to bless you, he sends the right people. That's what he did for the Apostle Paul. He says, I'm about to comfort you. Look at these words that he says later on in that epistle of 2 Corinthians. For even when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. Listen to these words. We were afflicted on every side. Conflicts without, fears within. Here it comes, verse 6. But God, who comforts the depressed, comforted us by the coming. And you would think, could it be the Holy Spirit? Could it be... Could it be uh, coming from the presence of Jesus, a vision? No, no, no. By the coming of Titus, God goes, I'm about to bless you and I'm going to send you someone to bless you. I, I had someone this last week send me an encouraging text and then right on the heels of it said, I apologize for me for bothering me by sending it. And, and my response was this. I said, bother? I said, seriously, how can encouragement be a bother? And I told my friend, I said, don't ever apologize for sending an encouraging text. He said, I just know you're busy. I said, don't apologize. We all need encouragement. And I told him the, the famous uh, Truett Cathy statement from the founder of Chick-fil-A. He says, how do you know if someone needs encouragement? If they're breathing. And I was breathing, I needed encouragement. But what blows me away about th what the sending of Titus and the comfort that Paul was about to give to the Corinthian church is the full circle com comfort that happens in this, in, this, in this chapter. Listen, God comforted Paul by the coming of Titus to Macedonia. That's 2 Corinthians 7, 6. But let's read the next verse. He says, but God who comforts the depressed, comforts us by the coming of Titus. That's the people part. That's number one. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort in which he was comforted. Titus was comforted in you, did you get that? Titus was comforted by the Corinthians and then Titus took the comfort of the Corinthians and came and comforted Paul. And then Paul in turn comforted the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 1.6. So God's comfort comes full circles from the Corinthians to and through Titus to Paul to and through Paul back to the Corinthians. It's full circle comfort. Titus got comfort from the Corinthians, Paul got comfort from Titus, and the Corinthians got comfort from Paul. This is amazing to me. All of this, that if one of those people stops and thinks that my comfort is the end and not me comforting others, the circle's broken. How powerful is that? If one person misses this step and it just goes, I feel better now. Someone ministered to me and didn't take the next step. If Titus goes, the Corinthians comforted me, I'm finished. Then what happens to Paul? And if Paul goes, I was comforted, I don't have to do anything else. What happens to the Corinthian church? Every one of us has to take that step. We are comforted to be comforters, not comforted to be comfortable. And then he says there's a second thing that can happen in our comfort when we're going through that pain chapter. It's the paraclete. That's, the, that's a Greek word for the Holy Spirit. I, 
I, I wanted to make it memorable. So taking that P word for the Holy Spirit, you're going to see why this is important. Paraclete is a Greek word that Jesus used to describe the Holy Spirit. And that word actually means comforter. It's us realizing God with me, that's encouraging. But God in me, that's comforting. We have the Holy Spirit abiding in us. This is what Jesus said about the comforter. John 14, 16. I will pray that the Father and he shall give you another comforter. Boy, I need him. That he may abide with you forever. He says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. This is so powerful. When God is with you, there's no such thing as coincidence. It is providence. And I want us to think about that for just a few moments. When God is with us, there's no such thing as coincidence or chance. It's providence. Providence is a comfort, a comfort to me. I, I just read recently that a beginner chess player at most will think three moves ahead. My son at university is not only learning, but also helping to teach some other, some other athletes there on, on how to play chess. But as a b- beginners only think two or three moves ahead, but a chess master, it says, thinks 30 moves ahead, 30 moves ahead. In fact, some of them say they can see the whole game developing on the first move of their opponent. Can, can I give you some comfort today? We, we do have a master and he sees way more than 30 moves ahead. He sees the whole big picture. That's called the providence of God. He's a, he is a life master. He is my master and he can be your master today. See, a coincidence is what just happens. Providence is what's directed by God to happen. God is moving the pieces in place going, I've got your life in hand, no matter what happens. See, providence is God's intentions revealed. See, there's no coincidence in God, only his intentions. And thinking about that, my life received comfort just reading the story of of Joseph. Think of his painful chapters, a lot of them. Some of it, decades of painful chapters. And one phrase kept standing out to me as he was going through his pain chapters. He was, he, he was sold into slavery by his brothers. And when Joseph in chains gets to Egypt, it says in Genesis 39, 2, and the Lord was with Joseph. Then when he gets to Egypt, he's put into a house in, as a servant, and Joseph is falsely accused, thrown into prison under a false accusation. And it says while in prison in Genesis 39, 21, but the Lord was with Joseph. I was just amazed as I thought through this that God was going to use every bad thing that came against him, his pain chapter, to the place he needed to be so that he could eventually be a blessing to his own family and rescue them from a famine. Remember Romans 8, 28? And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. I, I kept thinking of that phrase in Romans 8, 28, all things, all things, all things. Can all things actually mean everything? Or is all things only good things? Can all things mean people's sin, people's, um, or other people's evil acts? Here's what I've learned about all things. All things actually means all things. Look at the life of Joseph and consider all the evil that has been done even against you. Think about that. I want you to think of Joseph's life and think of the attacks that have even maybe come against you. Here's what I, I, I just listed them down and it became an encouragement to me on the providence of God. God are moving the chess pieces in place. Think of this. Let me list them for you. The irresponsibility of Jacob as a father to give Joseph a coat with many colors. The pride of Joseph to tell his dream to his brothers with his coat on. The jealous, jealousy of his brothers to sell him into slavery. The greed of the Ishmaelites to make a buck and sell Joseph to Egypt. The lust and accusation of Potiphar's wife to get him to prison to meet two guys. The brashness of Pharaoh to lock up his staff members in prison. And the offense and the criminal offense of the baker and the cupbearer that ends up meeting Joseph. 
Can I just tell you something? God took irresponsibility, pride, jealousy, greed, lust, accusation, brashness, rashness, offense, and said, I'm making all things work together. He's taking the chess pieces and going, I can get you here, move you over here. All things work together for good. So that man could be a comforter to his own family and rescue them out of famine later on in the story. God is amazing. God knows how to move those chess pieces. There is people that he'll use to comfort. There is the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, as a comforter. Let me give you a third one. It's prophecy. This is very clear in the scriptures. I believe, we here believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I believe they are in operation today. I believe God uses people with those 1 Corinthians 12, 14, and Romans 12 gifts now. And I feel sad for those that believe that those gifts are no longer needed and no longer in operation today. You know what I say to those people? If you need comfort in trials, and then you need the gifts of the Holy Spirit operating today. For those who think they don't exist, you may have just lost maybe a part of comfort that God was wanting to give you because you decided those gifts don't exist today. Man, that, that just blows me away because one of the clear and comforting gifts is a gift even of prophecy, the Bible says. I can't tell you how many times God brought hope to me through a prophetic word, one of those gifts. Our overseer here at Times Square Church, Pastor Carter Conlon, has been one of those that have been used in that gift of prophecy, even over my own life. David Wilkerson, the founder of the church, same thing in my own life. And 1 Corinthians 14.3 is true about bringing comfort in painful situations. Here it is, 1 Corinthians 14.3. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation, here it comes, and comfort to men. I am so excited what's getting ready to happen on Easter weekend. Here at Times Square Church, it starts on Friday night and goes through resurrection morning. On April 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, is going to be a weekend here at Times Square Church online that, is, that has never been seen before. It's called Three Days Later. You, you are going to see from, from an original Times Square Church movie like you did at Christmas, and now an Easter, uh, not only movie, but also music. From, from the choir to the worship to the movie, it is going to be an amazing three-day event. It's going to start on Friday night where we're going to get a chance to share communion together. And then it's going to end with a celebration on Sunday, April 4th, as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday together. I I want you to go to the website at tsc.nyc forward slash Easter and how to get even more information. But even more so, you may, God may be wanting to use you as a comforter, a comforter to, to even host maybe even a watch party wherever you are around the world, in Italy or in Spain, in the UK, in the Caribbean, in Mexico, in Colombia. Wherever that may be, God may be speaking to you. I want you to host a watch party. And maybe that next step for you is to go to tsc.nyc forward slash Easter to say, what are my next steps to do that? And to get others to watch with you so they can find love and hope and find Jesus, especially on Resurrection Weekend. Everything is going to start at 7 p.m. on Friday night and then 7 p.m. on Saturday night. These are all going to be different showings. And then on Sunday... We're going to have our Easter service, and then it'll be on demand from there. But I want you to go to tsc.nyc forward slash Easter and get, and, and get ready to watch our Easter film called Three Days Later. But I want to talk to you about something, thinking of that word, the prophetic, that, that took place. Because you're going to see something happen during that, that weekend that you're going to see online as I was talking to some of our band members and our worship leaders, you're going to see a cellist on stage whose name is Nurmira. And it was prophecy that brought encouragement even to me that God is moving the chess pieces, the providence of God and the pro- prophecies, the gifts of the Spirit. Nurmira is, is from Europe and one of the Russian stands, I think it's uh, Kyrgyzstan that she's from, And while she was there, she came across David Wilkerson's book, The Cross and the Switchblade, in her own language. While she was there, she was playing the cello and one day wanted to go to Juilliard. But who would know that God would use that book to bring her to salvation? When she left her her country, came to New York City, was accepted to Juilliard, 
She realized that David Wilkerson's church, Times Square Church, was not far from where she was at going to school. She went, I heard, to Times Square Church, walked into the building. There wasn't a service that day, but she looked at that stage and she felt that God spoke to her. It was like really a prophetic word and said, one day you would play your cello on that stage at Times Square Church. I came to the church on Saturday during the Easter rehearsal just to see the filming and just enjoy the worship that was happening that you're going to get to see on that Friday, Saturday, and Sunday during the Easter weekend. And this is what I was told. When she was up there and on that Saturday, it was the fulfillment of a 14-year prophetic word that she had. As she was had that cello and was playing, she said, God reminded me 14 years ago, he spoke to me that this would happen. Numira is able to tell people God is faithful and God keeps his promises. Great is thy faithfulness. That word comforted me. Her, her prophetic moment was a comfort to me to realize that God comforts his people, all of his people. He'll do it with, he'll, he'll do it with people. He'll do it with the Holy Spirit. He'll do it with prophecy. Finally, number four in prayer. Let's finish with this. There's a fine line between gossip and intercession. Pastor Tim, what are you talking about? Stay with me. Do you know what intercession is? It's a, it's a word that, it's another word for prayer. It's when you talk to God about other people. But do you know what gossip is? Gossip is when you talk to people about people. Here comes the fine line. The fine line is that you tell the same information, but you tell it to different people. See, one person can do something about the situation that you're describing. The other people are only listening, probably sometimes maybe even getting angry themselves. Gossip and intercession are so closely associated, it's just an issue of who you go to about people. The Corinthians chose intercession and not gossip. They're about to show us what prayer for people can do for them. And what you're going to see is after Paul unpacks moving from pain to receiving comfort to becoming a comforter in verses 3 through 7 of 2 Corinthians 1, Paul is about to move from his theology on this. That is, remember, the pain, comfort, comforters, that huge step. He's about to move from his theology, here it comes, to transparency. That's verse 8. Here's what he says. He says, for we don't want you to be unaware, brethren. This is, Paul, this is Paul being very transparent of our affliction, which came to us in Asia. We were so burdened excessively, even beyond our strength. And Paul said this, we even despaired even our own life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a peril of death, he says, and will deliver us. He will on he on whom we have set our hope, he will yet deliver us. And then he says in verse 11, you, you Corinthians, you joined in and helped us, helped us through your prayers. There it is. That's the fourth comforter. Through your prayers. So that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the favor, the favor of God, the, 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 what we need, the equipping of God that was bestowed on us. How? Through the prayers of the many. Oh my goodness. Intercession is so powerful and so important. I love what one man said. He said it like this. Intercessory prayer might be defined as loving our neighbor on our knees. The Corinthian church loves Paul and loved him on his knees. Or as the old hymnist William Cowper penned these words, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon their knees. Satan was trembling and Paul was being strengthened by these Corinthian prayers. Or if you want a real punch, like a real, uh, uh, like almost a feeling of this verse, let me read it to you from the message. This is what Paul said. This is how Paul, how, how Eugene Peterson paraphrased it, Paul's words. He says, you and your prayers he says, are part of a rescue operation. I love that. I don't want you in the dark about that either. I can see your faces even now. Lifted in praise for God's deliverance of us. Rescue, a rescue in which your prayers played such a crucial part. 
Wow, that's so powerful. I love that paraphrase. See, every time you pray for someone, you are helping them. You're on the rescue operation. Intercession is so much better than gossip. That's why choose to talk to the right person about the information you have about people. Don't talk to people about people. Talk to God about people. And the Corinthian church did it and amazing things happened. Paul goes, you went on a rescue operation when you started praying for me. That's what I want to do for people. You know what I've learned about praying for people, about intercession? When I pray for people, I don't gossip about people. Let me say that again. When I pray for people, I don't gossip about them. I'm on a rescue mission. I'm, I'm going after them. I'm on a rescue operation. You get to be connected to people through your prayer life and be on a rescue mission for them. When your prayer life is weak, then so is our helping of people weak. And I really believe people we love and their deliverance from a situation could very well be connected to mine in your prayer life. Their, their chapter of pain may hinge on whether we're going to pray about them instead of telling others what they're going through. That we can just go, God, help us. Help us to be comforters. We want to pray for those people. God bruises you to use you. Your comfort is not to be comfortable, but to be a comforter. The end goal is not out of my pain, but ministering from my pain. And here's what I kept thinking about. Without God, without the master chess player putting the pieces in order, you know what happens to people? Their only goal in life is just to make it through tough times and never seeing the giant picture that Paul lays out for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I can't make it in life without God. I can't make sense of life without God. That's why Psalm 46 has some of the most intense upheaval happenings, but it all starts with God to get through it. Listen, listen to it. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Just listen to the next two verses. He says, therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed. <laughs> Doesn't get any worse than that. Though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, Though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. That's incredible. Mountains are carried. Waters are roaring. Mountains are shaking. The earth is, is being removed. And the first thing that he says is, God is my refuge. He realized in Psalm 46, take the worst situation, your worst pain chapter, and you start that chapter off. Here it is with God. That before he gets to mountains and waters and the earth, he starts off Psalm 46 and says, God, God is my refuge. God is my strength. God is my very present help in time of trouble. And I want to ask you that question. Can you say that today? Does your painful moments, does your painful seasons start off with God at the very top like Psalm 46? Because if not, I want to do what the Corinthians did for Paul. I want to pray a prayer that is a rescue operation for you. It's a prayer that will rescue you, not simply from a painful season of your life, but a painful eternity. It's a prayer, it's a rescue from hell to get you to heaven. It's the most important question I can ask you, any one of us can ask you. It's the most important question is this, have you been born again? Because until you can answer that question, then God is not the first one on the top of the list like Psalm 46. You could, put, you could put anything else on the bottom. You just go, it's COVID, it's, it's loss, it's civil unrest, it's, it's this election, it's America. It's, you put whatever, whatever you want to put there. But if you don't have God, then all of a sudden life doesn't seem to work. You're just trying to get out of one pain moment to another pain moment. And I'm here to tell you this. The question is, have you been born again is the most important question. Because we're dealing with where you will spend eternity. It's not only God getting us through these moments, it's and getting us out of those painful things and helping us to become a comforter, but it's God getting us out of hell and translating us from, from a kingdom of darkness into a kingdom of light, like the Apostle Paul says. Today, this prayer is a rescue operation that can change your life. When I say, have you, have you been born again? There's people that will sit there and say, well, Pastor Tim, I've, I've been water baptized or I've had communion or I've gone to church or I'm a good person. And these are all good things, but that's, that's not the words that Jesus used. The, the word that Jesus used to know if God is in your life is have you been born again. He uses that word in John 3, 3 and 3, 5. He says, no person 
will ever see the kingdom of heaven unless they have been born again. Whether you're a student here in New York City, whether you're a student in Spain, whether you're a student in, in London, whether you're listening from Texas to Los Angeles, I want you to understand something. You have to answer that question. Well, Pastor Tim, what, why is that so important? Because Jesus said, you must, John 3, 5, be born again. That's what Jesus said. That's not a Times Square church word. It is a Jesus word. Well, Pastor Tim, then how do you become that? I, I want to make it as simple as I can. Like we would take our children through with the ABCs. I want to say, let me take you through the ABCs. The simplicity of it. Using each letter for a word. A, admitting that I'm a sinner. To get honest with God. It's when I say and get honest with God and say, I have a condition. It's called sin. And it can't be fixed with a promise, a priest, a pastor, even a program. We need help to fix that because it is a heart condition. I'm broken on the inside. and The diagnosis is sin. And I have to admit, A, that I'm a sinner. Or as one pastor said, we're not mistakers in need of correction. We're sinners in need of a savior. We're, we, we need more than a second chance. We need a second birth. And that's why Jesus calls it being born again. But how does that happen? That's the B word, believe. Believe that God sent his son to fix our sinful condition. Why? Because I couldn't fix it myself. It's a heart condition. I can fix up the cosmetics on the outside, but I can't fix the heart. If we could fix ourselves and God putting his son through the suffering he went through would be the most ultimate case of child abuse in human history. If I could get myself to heaven by being good, then Jesus would never have had to come and die on the cross. See, Jesus' death was him being my sin bearer. He died the death that I should have died. He lived the life that I couldn't live. And then gave me a reward, forgiveness and eternity, heaven, that I didn't even deserve. And that's just by believing on him. He went to the cross for me. And finally, C, confessing Jesus as Lord. Those are big words. I don't think that God sent Jesus to die on the cross to get me to sit in a, a seat in a church on a Sunday, to watch for an hour and 15 minutes a, a, a church service off my phone, laptop, or iPad. His goal was not to get me to church one day a week, but his goal was to get us to heaven. See, coming to church or coming online for a service, that's religion. Being born again, that's a relationship. And Christianity is coming to a person, not a place. That person now is in charge. When you confess him as Lord, that's Romans 10, 9, and 10, you are saying he is the boss. You're in charge now. I don't do what you want me to do just on Sundays when I'm sitting in, in, your, in God's house. God doesn't get just Sundays, God gets it every day. That's called lordship. And just as you had a first birth, you need a second birth. Where your first birth was in a hospital, physically, that second birth or second birth date is something that happens spiritually. Here comes the prayer of rescue, that 1 Corinthians 10, that 1 Corinthians 1.10. Here comes the rescue operation. This is where the prayer that can rescue you from a path going to hell for eternity and now forgiveness and heaven can come. Wherever you're at right now, if you're sitting on a couch, if you're, if you're at a fitness center, if you're driving in a car, on a train or a bus, if you're in Europe or Asia or right here in the United States or right even here in New York City, I want you to pray this rescue operation prayer with me. A prayer that wants to invite God to come into your life, that says, I can't start any chapter, any day, let alone Psalm 46, every day of my life has to start off with that first word, God. God is my refuge. God is my strength, my very present help in time of trouble. Wherever you're at, you're saying, Pastor Tim, I want to pray that prayer. I, I want to pray that with you. Wherever you're at, I want you to pray this with me right now. Come on. I'm going to repeat a line, and I want you just to repeat it with me. Let it come from the heart and realize that this is a rescue operation today. Come on, say this with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you're the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, 
and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. Come on now, say it with me. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Man, happy birthday. Happy second birthday to you. I'm so excited that you made this decision today. I'm just going to ask you to take one simple step that's going to help you on this brand new journey that you've chosen. You made a decision today. And if you prayed that prayer with us, I want to ask you just to do one thing. You're going to see it on the screen. I want you to text the word DECIDED to 51000, 51,000. Text DECIDED. And then what happens after that, we want to walk you on a next six-week process of giving you some simple, short, helpful videos and some connections and connect groups and some things that are going to begin to challenge you and help you on taking that next step. You decided today the best and the greatest decision of your life. God bless you.